says, my, very small, well, let's read that together. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. Do me a favor and find a few people. Just, just find three people and just say grace for my case. Come on, three people. Grace for my case. Grace for my case. So good to see Brother Tristan here. Hey Amen. I thank God for his ministry. Grace for my case. Well, oh God, we thank you now for these moments we have. We yield to you, God. Our focus is completely on you, God. We bind the devil in the name of Jesus. We refuse to be distracted. We're not chatting or having conversations, but we're listening to the Holy Spirit. Speak to our heart, interpreting the words and the words of the preacher. Help, Holy Spirit. Be our translator. Be our interpreter. Speak to us. Apply this to the situations, circumstances, the calamities, the hardships, the insults, the persecutions, and the difficulties that we have to face. We thank you now. Solo Dio Gloria. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Randomly and routinely, I make it my practice to present to my wife an expression of my love. Routinely on her birthday, Valentine's and such. And then randomly just because I will make sure I get at least a dozen long stem roses, oftentimes in a box. And I present them or have them presented to her so that she might know that I love her and her co-workers might know to push back. <laughs> Randomly and routinely, I make it my practice to present to her roses. Imagine if on one occasion she received long stem roses in a large box. Excited, she rushes home now to put them in a box. And in opening the box, she takes these beautiful aromaphile roses and she lifts them to set them in the freshly poured and prepared water, only to be pricked. Suddenly, with a sharp pain, a thorn has pricked her. She would then have two options. She could look at the roses and say, this jive turkey done sent me some roses with a thorn in them. I will throw these away. I do not want them. Or she could respond after being pricked by the thorn by placing the flowers, the roses in the box and simply saying that the beauty of the roses outweighs the sting of the thorn. She could say, the purpose behind the present is more powerful than the pain in the thorn. Amen. In a very real sense, what this pedagogic, peripatetic preacher, Paul, is trying to say to us is that God gives great gifts and every now and then the gift may include some particularity that we find uncomfortable but in maturity our response should not be throwing the roses out but instead we should say these come from God and they're beautiful 
have a aroma field. I don't know what your situation is, but I do believe you too have a thorn. I'll explain that later. I believe you too have a thorn. And at least part of Paul's message is that the roses are still beautiful, still valuable, still wonderful, even with the thorn in them. That, that life may not be perfect. That you may not get and you may not have everything you wanted, when you wanted, and how you wanted. But if you would be honest with yourself, what God has given you is still a gift. That the life God has given you, that the blessings God has given you, that the love God has shown you is still beautiful and aroma filled. Paul is writing a third letter to the church at Corinth. I call it 2 Corinthians, but it's actually the third letter that he wrote. Paul was fond of Corinth. Being that he was a peripatetic preacher, he traveled from place to place. But the Lord allowed Paul to stay with Corinth for almost two years. So he had a special friendship and relationship with the people of Corinth. But somehow, there were those in the church who were attacking him and assailing him. They were saying every manner of evil and bad thing about him they could. They had three major points. Their first point, they said, Paul, you're just not powerful enough. And then here's the next one. I know this had to hurt. I mean, this had to get in his heart. And, and Paul, you don't preach very well. And, and then lastly, uh, which I will never be accused of, they, they said, Paul, you don't accept pain. So consequently, you can't be called to serve Corinth. Yeah. Paul very boldly responds. Now he, he moves not in sarcasm, but he, he offers up, if you will, in second person. He says, I know somebody who 14 years ago was taken up to heaven. Now I don't know if I was taken up physically or spiritually, but I was taken up. And God showed me such great things, I cannot utter them. It was amazing. Then he says, what? I'm not going to brag about what God has done, even though I'm old. But what I will do is I'll say that God has done so much. He says, in fact, what I can tell you is I've got some weaknesses. He says, I've got some lacking, some shortcomings. But God says that it's in that condition, it's in that state, that God gets the best glory. God says that in your weakness, then you're strong. All right. I was going to stand before you, and I was simply going to tell you about the abundance of God's grace. I'm going to share that God has so much grace that you can't use it up. Almost like trying to get a straw and drink the Atlantic Ocean. You can't use it up. Almost like trying to get a suntan and stay underneath the sun. The sun will still shine. You can't use it up. Then I was going to round it out and tell you about Alexander the Great. He was traveling with his soldiers and a poor person had the gall to say, Alexander, I am poor. I need your help. Could you help me? And Alexander took a sack of gold coins and he gave it to the beggar. To this, his soldiers responded, do you realize how much you gave that beggar? You could have given copper and that would have taken care of it for a long time. And Alexander responded, well, I did not give him copper because I give gold. That's the way I give. That's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you that God's abundance in grace. That the God has so much grace. That's Monday. I, Monday, I was looking at the text. I was writing the text. That's what I was going to tell you. But then when I went back and I studied the word, exegeted the, the text, it does not mean God's grace is abundance. This text doesn't mean 
That is true, but this text does that mean? This text instead means something different. This text says that God is a pharmacist. And that God looks at your sickness. God looks at your condition. God looks at your ailment. And he sits in his laboratory and he designs a medicine that's a perfect fit for you. So, 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 so don't, don't think that this is just about violence because it's about God's personal consideration. Oh, okay. Uh, you, you know that uh, Martin Luther King was noted for loving humanity. Mother Teresa was noted for loving humanity. Mahatma Gandhi was noted for loving humanity. And I appreciate Mother Teresa. I appreciate Martin Luther King. I appreciate Mahatma Gandhi. What? With all their love, their love does not compare to my mama's love. Because my mama loves me. And it's good to know that yes, God loves everyone, but you better recognize he loves you. In fact, he loves you so much, you know, mommy, that if you were the only one on earth and there was sin in the earth, that God would still say, son, we're going to wrap you in flesh, call you Emmanuel, send you to Bethlehem, you're going to die on a rugged cross because somebody needs to be saved. I, I, I messed up there. I messed up there. I, I didn't say that right. Not somebody needs to be saved, but you need to be saved. No, 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 no. Please, please. We're not talking about everybody now. We're talking about you. Now, now you know your name better than I. Could you say your name? Okay, so say, so, so say, because, say your name? Needs to be saved. Good practice. Because, needs to be saved. God says, if it was just you, I would have died for you. I love you that much. Yeah. Every now and then, if you have more than one children, you understand. You've you got to sit your children down. Mm -hmm. And you sit them down independently one at a time. You take them out and you say, but yes, we're having another baby, but I still got love just for you. Amen. God has a love fit for you. Okay, his grace is fit for you. First, this text is tailored to teach us that God's grace is fit for our assignment. Amen. The Bible, because the issue was whether Paul was able to do and could do or was doing what he was called to do. And the people at Corinth were attacking him. They were saying, oh no, you're not on that. Oh no, you can't do that. Oh no, no, no. And if you live a year beyond three, somebody will attack you. Somebody will tell you that you are not, that you are that you can't, that, that you won't, that you're not enough, you're sorry, and you're just not sufficient. So we can learn a lot from Paul. Because Paul responds by saying, that's not what God says. You miss it. <laughs> the, the next time you, you have an altercation, the next time you're on your job, the next time somebody's trying to mess with you in a classroom, in a restaurant, on a date, just say, that's not what God says. God says, I am what he wants me to be. That he's made me, that he's shaped me, and, and I am just what he wants me to be. He says, God's grace is on me. No matter what you think, no matter what you say, God's grace is on me. That's what you need to understand. God says, for the assignment, okay, y'all, let me see if I can make a plan. Uh, we often think that God puts us where he wants us because of the gifts that we have. That's how you and I work. God doesn't work that way. I call it assignment alignment. God doesn't work that way. God doesn't see you and say, you're a good writer. I'm going to let you work for the newspaper. Instead, God says, I want you here. So I'm going to give you what you need to be there. All right. So, so, so think about Paul. Think about Paul. Paul was a theologian, but he also was a thug. I, I mean, he killed people. He chased them down with letters. Paul was a gospel globetrotter, but he also was a gangster. And, and, and so when, when Paul had to go through what he had to go through, Paul could take it. Paul could take it because he had dealt it out. Paul wasn't just a scholar behind the desk, but Paul was a rugged brother. So he could handle the mission and the journey he had to handle. And in fact, 
Uh, he was so bad that if, if he didn't have any money, he could make tents and get some money. Paul was a rugged brother. I mean, he could handle the assignment. And that's how God makes you. God makes you fit, okay, for your assignment. Uh, uh, he was 19 years old in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. He was 19 years old in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. His dream was to play roll tide roll, uh, play for University of Alabama. That was his dream. But uh, when he was 19 years old, he got his girlfriend pregnant. And, and he wanted to take care of his girlfriend and the baby, but it got especially bad. He was in junior college at the time. When he found out that his girlfriend, that the baby, the baby girl that was going to be born had spinal, uh, say it again, that's right. Uh, uh, and so because she had the spinal condition, he needed to get two jobs to take, take care of her. So he dropped out of school, got these two jobs, but he still didn't have enough money. And so one day he decided, you know what, I can't play football right now. Maybe I'll try boxing. And so he walked in the ring without, without a whole lot of practice. And Dante Wilder started boxing. He knocked the first guy out, first fight. Second, third, all the way up to the 32nd fight. He was knocking people out. Now he's the champion of the world. And he says that I would not be the champion of the world if my baby girl didn't need me to fight. I am fighting because of my assignment. You're missing that. That, 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 that some of the stuff that you are in is not an accident or an incident or, uh, or some mishap of God. But God said, no, I chose you for this. And I used that to get you to this. You're missing that. All right, all right, let me see if I can make a plan. His name is Sully. Sully was a pilot, but in addition to being a pilot, he liked to study safety maneuvers. In fact, he started a small firm as a pilot to teach other pilots how to handle in-flight challenges. So he would study and research, and then one day, he happened to be flying over the Hudson River. Sully was flying over the Hudson River, and some geese, started flying in the air. And the geese got caught in the engine. And at that point, they lost all engine power. They had 150 passengers on the flight, and they had five flight members. And he said, all right, guys, I, I train people on how to handle this situation. And they said, yeah, I know you train people, but there's a river under us, and the plane is going down. He said, that's all right, guys. Tell everybody on the plane to fasten their seatbelts. We're going to land. They said, okay, which runway are we trying to get to? No, 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 no. We're going to land on the Hudson River. They said, no, uh, look, look, Sonny, Sonny, I appreciate your studies, but, but planes like this don't land on water because this plane wasn't meant to land on water. Water. It was meant to land on runways. It, it, we, we can't do this. He said, no, no, sit back and relax. And he literally landed an airplane on the water. The plane stayed on the water. And every single person got off the plane and nobody was killed. Sully was there because God wanted him there. And he came into that calamity, that situation, because God knew he had prepared Sully for that flight. And all I'm trying to say is God has prepared you for the flight that you have to take. And he knows that you know everything you need to land your plane. First, it's the assignment. That, that we have grace for the assignment in our life. I don't know if you have to raise some knucklehead children. I don't know if you have to make some finances out of pennies. I, I don't know if you have to make a relationship work that's really hard. I don't know if you have to do something in a, a work environment that seems impossible. But God says, I got you and, and you got this. Who you missed that? I got you and you got you. You missed that. I got you and you got this. You need to tell your neighbor right now. I got you and you got this. No, no, you didn't tell me. You didn't tell me you're looking at me. I got you and you got this. Every now and then, God says that I need you to accept the boldness that the blessings on your life endow you. That, that you got to be willing. My wife said, honey, that, 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 that coat's a little bright. It's a little bold. I said, maybe I want to be bold today. Uh, you, you got this. God says that you got this. I don't care how bad it looks. I don't care how hard it seems. I don't care how weak you feel because in your weakness, then you're strong. So first, it's for the assignment. But, but this is, it seems the same, but let me show you, it's different. But it's also for the affliction. 
God says that for the pain that you have to endure, I've got the grace that you need. Now, some people somehow preach that this means that God will remove the pain. Wake your neighbor. Wake your neighbor. It, it doesn't mean that. This does not say that God will remove the pain. I know that's what you wanted to hear. I know that's what you were hoping I would say. And I could say it, but I really believe in God. So since I really believe in God, I'm scared to lie on God. It is not saying that God will remove the pain. Now I know there's some theological thinkers and, and they have what I call a Linus theology. Take up your blanket and follow me. Y'all don't remember Linus. Linus was this little guy. Wrong audience, my bad. Uh, but, but every now and then, we like to think that God says, Comfort is the promise I put over your life. You will always be comfortable. It will always be easy. You'll never have stress. You'll never have trouble. Oh, just skip and flip your ankles. Everything is all right. No. Sometimes God says the opposite. And God says you will have to endure some trials. You will have to endure some hurts. The load will be heavy. The marriage won't always be easy. The finances won't always be enough. But look, I got you. My grace is sufficient. So I don't know what it is. You, you, you may, and I, I come out to say that I deeply believe that all of us have a thorn. You say, well, what is the biblical rationale for such? Well, one, uh, Paul was a teacher. So the reason he is sharing this is because he's trying to teach us the principle. But two, Paul knew he had this revelation uh, that required an affliction. And just like Paul has been given a revelation, did you know and do you know that all of us here today have been given a revelation? Oh yeah, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, then you have the Holy Spirit, and you hopefully have a Bible, and you showed up to Bible study, and day after day you're getting revelations from the Holy Spirit. Well, just as Paul had a revelation, because you have a revelation, I'm moving on, that you need to have something to keep you grounded. Okay, I'll move on. So he talks about the affliction. Let me see if I can make this plain, and I'll, I'll be done. My friend, Dr. James Jackson, in Indianapolis was explaining it this way. He said that uh, when he was in junior college, before he got serious about school, when he was in junior college, he used to like to go to the student union. And he would stay there all day and all night. And he liked to play spades. Oh, yeah, that, that was the game. Now, I know y'all good holy Christians. You guys were not in the lottery lines yesterday, and so you don't know anything about spades. Well, well, well I don't know anything about spades either, but let me explain. It's biblical. He talked about how one season in his life, as he played the game of spades, every time he got a hand, his hand was a bad hand. He called it a bleeding hand. There was lots of red in it. Uh, there was no good cards. And so he would get his hand and he would throw it in. But then one day, he had a bad hand. He looked down, discouraged. And he lifted up his head and he noticed in spades you have partners. That his partner had a bright smile on his face. He had a bad hand, he was down, but he looked up and he noticed that his partner had a bright smile on his face. And his partner shook his head like, yeah, we got this, we got this. And at that point, Rob Jackson looked at his hand, looked at his partner, hand bad, partner happy, hand bad, partner happy. And he started talking mess. He said, yeah, we're going to get y'all now. Yeah, we got this. Now, nothing changed in his hand. But he recognized that it didn't matter what was in his hand. Because he had a partner who had everything he needed in his hands. So this is trying to say to us, even when we've got to carry a bad hand, our partner is reminding us that I still have a power in my hand. That yes, it may not be working. And yes, you might be hurting. And you throw out what you have, but your partner keeps on going away. And at the end of the day, because of your partner. Okay, okay, last thing. I promise you I'm done. Because it's not about us. It's about God. God doesn't want you to depend on you. He wants you to depend on Him. And the only way He can get you to depend on Him is to remove some of your strengths, to remove some of the stuff that you've been holding on to and leaning on. Then he says, I got you. All right, all right. The last thing I want to give you from this text. This 
so much we can say, but let me give you just one more. This text gives a certain assurance, and the assurance is that if God gives you an affliction or assignment, that it is not wasted. Okay, that doesn't seem like much, does it? But, 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 but take your thorn, your situation, your struggle, your trial, and think this, that God has given me this for a reason. And God is going to use this to bless me and bless others. God has given me this for a reason. Y'all missing this. And God is going to use this to bless me and bless others. I don't know if you've got some medical condition that requires that you take medicine, or you've been going through depression, or, or you have a, a, a you've gone through divorce, or, or there's something God says, uh, this is not an accident, it is not a waste, but I am going to use this to bless you and to bless others. It does not seem logical, it does not seem reasonable, it don't make no sense, but God says, I'll use it. Okay. All right, I thought this would happen. My baby girl helped me. You know, you know, I like talking about my kids. Well, my baby girl, uh, we went out and I got her a balloon because I'm a good daddy and it was free. So I got her this balloon and it was a helium-filled balloon. But before the man could hand her the balloon, he took the balloon and he took something and he tied it to the bottom of the balloon. Then the balloon went up, but it didn't take off. And, and I had a conversation. I said, uh, excuse me, excuse me, not to the man, but to the balloon. I said, I wonder why you got that on you. It seems to be keeping you down. And the balloon said to me, hold on, I was made to rise. But if I didn't have a weight, then I wouldn't be any earthly good. So the weight that I am carrying me keeps me in my master's hand. Yo, mister, all I'm trying to say is that what God does is he allows a weight on you so that he can kick you so that you don't take off and you're no longer good. God says, the reason I let 